Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls present over here. We are Triton, and today we are going to share with you the story of a common man amongst you. Mr. Shweb Qureshi was a common man. He had a happy life. He used to be a police van driver and a part-time electrician. While once on a routine patrol, his van was fired upon. On that fateful night in March 2013, Mr. Shweb Qureshi had a bullet enter his spinal cord. After the operation was done, the doctor had removed the bullet, but they told him that he had lost all control of his legs and will not be able to move at all. But that wasn't the worst of it. Mr. Shweb Qureshi, but that wasn't the worst of it. Mr. Shweb Qureshi then had to undergo rehabilitation procedures, which cost him in the first year more than a million Pakistani rupees. He had to travel with his ailing mother or his father to the rehabilitation center, where he would be told to do things that we take for granted, like going to the bathroom and sleeping with one of his side turned so that he does not develop pressure sores on his legs. What Mr. Shweb Qureshi suffers from is called paraplegia. It is the loss of all activity in your lower body. And Mr. Shweb Qureshi is not the only one. There are over 150,000 paraplegics existing in Pakistan as we speak. There are over 250,000 annual cases appearing each year globally. There is no known proper cure for this disability, and it renders a person absolutely psychologically damaged as well. But how do you think that we can solve this? Now, you might be thinking that this is a talk about where we get to tell you how we aim to solve this. But this is rather a talk in which we introduce to you the idea where we help understand the person we're dealing with and help him understand himself so that he is able to voice his opinion on what can be done. So how do we fit into the story? A little over a year ago, we were tasked with making an exoskeleton for paraplegics as our final year project. We were very excited. To tell you the truth, we wanted to make Iron Man, but then we decided to just stick with the legs. During our research, we had to understand properly what entailed this disability. And so, our journey took us from Karachi to as far as the Peshawar Paraplegic Center in Hayatabad. Over there, we consulted with doctors and experts and medical professionals in order to better gauge the extent of this disability. After we had gathered all of the data, we compiled it, and after numerous research papers and countless hours of working, we were able to develop what we call EXO. EXO was an electromechanical wearable robot for people who can't walk, like Mr. Shweb Qureshi. So it allowed them mobility and a little more freedom than they already had. 
We were able to make this in one-fifth the cost of what its international competitors cost. The international competitors available globally The international competitors available globally were available for between 40,000 US dollars and 120,000 US dollars. We were able to make this product in 8,000 US dollars. And we were very happy with it. We had the constraints of affordability and ease of use, and we thought that we had covered that very perfectly. I mean, this would be the problem, the cure to the problem that the world has been looking for, right? But we realized that we were pretty wrong. This exoskeleton did give them the ability that they had lost biologically, but there were a lot of factors that we were not looking at. For example, the fact that not every paraplegic available in our country can actually afford an 8,000 US dollar suit, plus the training that entailed its use. Once we had realized that, we knew we needed to change our strategy in order to help the disabled amongst us. So we moved forward and came up with an innovative replacement to the conventional trikes you see for the disabled people on the streets of Karachi. What we made, we called Yellow. Yellow was a $100 solution to our $8,000 problem. It was ergonomic. <laughs> Yellow was ergonomic. It was made with the masses in mind, and now literally hundreds of thousands of disabled people could use this to move around the city. What better could we do? We were again very happy with ourselves. But as always, we were very wrong again. We were missing out a complete point that entails this disability because we were limited by the box that we were in as engineers. And so, after we reanalyzed and researched all of the disabilities, we found out that even though yellow was made on the design of a robot to become a land vehicle for the disabled, it did not solve their problem of reintegrating into the society. How can we do that as engineers, we asked ourselves. And then we moved forward and realized that all of the stories that we've read about disabled people actually have the same underlying theme. And it is two major factors. The first factor is that even though the biological implications of this disability is a lot, the psychological implications are equally damaging, if not more. And the second implication was startling. Morbid, as this may sound to all of you sitting over here, this could happen to anybody. It could be your loved ones, it could be your parents, it could be complete strangers. And we, as society, have no idea how to deal with the disabled. Frightening, yes. Mr. Musa used to be a paint wholesaler before he lost all his ability to walk and control his lower body 10 years ago. Mr. Salman Pirzada was an accomplished musician before he lost his ability to be mobile around the city. They had never imagined that this would happen to them. They had never even prepared for this or thought that this could be a real possibility in their lives because, hey, how could that happen to me? Frightening, yes, but it isn't all that bleak because even though these people might be disabled in one way, they do have a greater insight into the human condition. Their ability to look at things is so different and their perspectives is so changed that we have looked at numerous success stories where disabled people amongst us have done what we call the impossible as normal. Where those people, both in the past and still in the present, are doing things that are bringing them up on this stage such as ours. So we asked ourselves, what was it that those people had but not every disabled person did not. And what was it that we could do to find it out? And what was it that could be done of it after we had found it? Okay, so, hello, yeah. So, we look back into history and we recognize a sort of a pattern. And the pattern was that as individuals, our productivity depends majorly on the number of tools that are available to us. Like today, we can see that our factories and offices, they're all equipped with tools and devices that help us perform complex tasks. And so the first thing we thought about was enabled education. Sorry, enabled engineering. Uh, what it means is that if we increase the number of devices available to the people with disabilities, we can empower them to be more productive. 
When we look around us, we may see, uh, we see many of the technologies which were initially developed for the disabled are now being used by common people. All of us watch movies with subtitles, right? So, but many of us do not know that subtitles were initially uh, developed for people who had hearing difficulties. Same goes for touch screens. They're everywhere in our mobile phones, computers, and ATM machines, but they were initially designed for people with dexterity issues. We believe that by creating products with disability considerations, we can make products which are not only more efficient and easier to use, but they're also cheaper and more user-friendly. And these products will also have the added, uh, added benefit of helping the disabled live more productive lives. But how do we go about building better designs? We suggest hiring the experts. And by experts, I mean the very people who we're trying to help. And isn't that what participation is all about anyway? We believe that as designers, it would actually help us make better products if we make use of the experiences and opinions of the disabled during the design process. But something's still missing. Merely creating more devices for people with disabilities is a step in the right direction, sure. But it won't solve the problem entirely. Um, so we re revisited our research, and what we realized was that uh, uh, an equally uh, larger, uh, that if we are to help rehabilitate people with disabilities, we must start at uh, the basic. That is, we must start with eradicating the stigma that is disability. Uh, we uh, feel that the feelings of helplessness and the feelings of uh, being dependent and the fact that they feel that they're being a burden to their families does great psychological damage to uh, the disabled. Um, now, when we were designing EXO, we once asked uh, Mr. Shwari Qureshi that uh, uh, when we were, we were once told him that the exoskeleton that we were designing could in the future do even more complex functions. Uh, the exoskeleton could help him perform his physiotherapy uh, uh, exercises and could uh, remind him for his uh, uh, medicines and stuff. Uh, what he told us was that he did not want any of that. What he wanted majorly uh, was the ability to stand again. Yeah. The conclusion we drew from this and many other uh, talks just like this was that uh, what they feel uh, what they feel is that their psychological disability is equally as uh, damaging as their uh, uh, physical disability, and we believe that we can solve this through education, uh, but not only of the disabled, we the education of the masses as well. Uh, but how do we do that? Firstly, uh, let's talk about the disabled. Uh, the disabled, we, we can teach the disabled, firstly, to uh, understand their disability. The fact that their disability, even if it does leave them unable to do some things, it does uh, leave them open to do a lot more things. Uh, there's this uh, South African astronomer, uh, Wanda Merced. And she's an astronomer, but she's blind. What she did was that after she was blinded in an accident, she developed a technique with the sonographers to uh, listen to radio telescope data. Okay, and she could recognize solar flares that everybody else, uh, supernovas that everybody else had missed. The point is that uh, if we educate them about their disability, they can contribute uh, more greatly to the society. Uh, secondly, most of the disabled people in Pakistan are uh, people who depend on vocational skills as a livelihood. Uh, we need to teach those people who have lost their livelihood other vocational skills as replacements for uh, the skills that they've lost. Uh, unemployment and uh, the feeling of being dependent is what we believe to be a primary uh, contributor to their psychological stress, and that is something that is curable. But uh, again, this is only a partial solution. We need to uh, train our masses as well. For example, us, if uh, most of us, if we are ever faced with a disability, because it's so unimaginable a prospect, we will never be able to uh, coop with ourselves or to understand that the other person who's uh, our relative or whatever is what, what are they feeling and what are they behaving so what we need to do is that what we feel is necessary is to incorporate education regarding the disability uh, disabilities major disabilities into our uh, college and university uh, educations at least uh, so that we don't freak out and uh, we make this world a less awkward place for them to live in we need to become less compassionate and more understanding of their plight. But again, this is only a partial solution. Now, we believe that a more far-reaching solution, a more global solution, is needed to ensure participation. 
And it was something that uh, Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, said in her TED Woman's talk that really clicked with us. It was, some, it was, something, it was something that was completely different, but, uh, what, uh, but it sort of made sense for the disabled people as well. It was something along the line that if you don't raise your hand, you will not be heard. What we're trying to propose is that we want to enable participation. We want to facilitate the raising of that hand. In countries such as ours, people with disabilities are automatically branded as mazur. And uh, for most jobs, they're just completely disregarded. This discrimination is uh, more visible in rural areas, where the people are required to input manual uh, hard labor. Now, what we need to do is to promote a culture of inclusiveness. What we, ne we need to go beyond the mechanical solutions that we as engineers can offer. We need everyone. It is vital for us to teach our leaders of tomorrow to not discriminate against people simply because of a physical disability. We need to create laws. We need to create a platform that ensures that those laws are followed and that inclusiveness is ensured. Now, earlier we were talking about, uh, earlier we were talking about the technologies that were developed to, for the people with disabilities. But the masses too reaped benefits from that. And that brings me to the future. The technology that we are working on today will eventually help us surpass our biological human limitations. Once perfected, the technology might have applications in bionics available as upgrades, as add-ons for our biological selves. What is fiction will, as always, become reality. To the point that one day, we hope to replace our biological selves entirely and say goodbye to the previously held paradigms we hold so dearly about our lives. So in summary, what we realize is simple. It is that not one sphere of our understanding can ever cure this problem that we are faced with in this world. And to give you the gist of it, our design philosophy is to do three things in this world to become a better facilitator for the disabled amongst us. It is to, one, have more design thinking so that we take in account all the disabled people amongst us. It is to, two, educate the masses. And thirdly, to include the participation of the disabled amongst us into our design thinking and everyday laws so that they are facilitated at the end. In the immortal words of Jigar Muradabadi, Befayda alam nahi, Befayda alam nahi, Bekar gham nahi, Taufeeq de khuda to ye naimad bhi kam nahi. Roughly translated to English, it goes along the lines of God willing, any calamity that we are faced with can be changed into a blessing. All that we need is the will to change it and a lot of human perseverance. Thank you.